Shalom. So if everyone can go on there, you'll find it on Rabbi Yom Tov Glazer. Um, and then uh, just click on the screen and, uh, and then share it. Uh, also, everyone watching, if you don't mind sharing it, let's see how, how many people we can get this out to. Today's class is called Connecting to God. And uh, it's generally what's been, uh, it's been on my mind lately, to connect to God. But it's on all of our minds, and uh, unfortunately, uh, many people have, fe been fe have felt they were ripped off, were raised observant. And uh, those who were not raised observant kind of felt like, like Judaism wasn't going to offer real connection to God. And so uh, altogether, it's been like a total loss. I mean, we're at 85% of Jews at this point don't even know uh, it's Shabbat when it's Shabbat. You know, which is the ultimate time to connect for those 24 hours. Uh, you also have the 15% who know it's Shabbat are, uh, you know, they may enjoy Shabbat, they may not, but, uh, but how much they're connecting to God during Shabbat, I don't know. And, um, and also a lot of that, am I wearing my heads? A lot of that. <laughs> It would be a great headset commercial. Watch, watch how long it takes someone to realize you're even wearing your iPhone headset because you forget you're wearing it. Yeah, these are the best. Amazing. Um, anyway, we want to connect. That's what it's all about. We want to connect to God. Um, just to mention, the, these classes are also on Shiur Enjoyment, S-H-I-U-R, SheurEnjoyment.com. For people who have kosher internet and are not connected to uh, Facebook. Um, it's not under people, it's under page. Oh, yeah? Or, yeah. It's Yom Tov Glazer. It's not Rabbi Yom Tov Glazer? It's Yom Tov Glazer? And you, it's under page? Page is pages. a place you can look? Mm -hmm. Like pages? Yeah. Found it. You found it? Yeah. So let's say it again. Tell people what to do. Just go to pages instead of people. Like pages instead of people. <laughs> I've never. I don't so little about Facebook. I didn't know there's such a thing as pages and people. So this is my page. Okay. Um, yeah. So here we go. Um, first of all, just an old distinction that I've put on the board several times. I'll put it on now. Is Black's not so great. Pull it out. That's much better. It's just the distinction that we've discussed several times. Just to get this out of the way, the distinction between connection, which is what this class is about, and alignment. Because Judaism has an inordinate amount of do's and don'ts, all those do's and don'ts are alignments. Just like when you get a car, you have do's and don'ts. When you go on a, when you have a, a spouse, you have do's and don'ts. Uh, when you go to a movie, there are do's and don'ts. Now, what, you, what are all those do's and don'ts? Those do's and don'ts are how you align to the situation in order to connect to the film or connect to the music or connect to, the, to one's spouse or to connect to God. God comes with do's and don'ts. Now, you might have the question, why do Jews have so many do's and don'ts? You know, Gentiles have seven, five negatives, two positive. Five negatives are the thou shalt nots. You know, they can't be cruel to animals. They can't lie. lie. They can lie. They, they can't be cruel to animals. They can't steal. They can't uh, uh, commit adultery, and they can't um, kill. Um, and then the last uh, don't is don't do idolatry. <laughs> Good luck convincing them of that. And uh, the other... The two positives are to create courts of justice, and the other positive is to believe in God. They only have to believe. Jews have to know. So we have, we have kind of a taller order. Ours requires evidence uh, to fulfill the commandment, and they don't need any evidence. They can actually just believe in God. That's enough for them to fulfill that. Whereas Jews have 613, I wouldn't even call them commandments, I would call them 613 hyperlinks. Each one takes you to its own website. And on that website, you can actually tape down the scroll button because it will just keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling with hundreds, if not thousands, of laws per commandment. Now, the, the reason we have all that detail 
You guys ever wonder why Jews have, like, why the detail? Like, does God really care about all this? God's so interested in all this detail. I mean, we, we had 2,500 years of history before there was any detail, right? Before the Sinai, what, what year was Sinai after Adam? Who knows? 2448. 48. Very good. 2448. Everyone say 2448. 2448. You can't forget that. 2448, like 24 hours, 48 hours. 2448 after Adam was Mount Sinai. It was in year 2448. And, and that means that two and a half millennia happened where there was no details other than those seven laws that I spoke about for Gentiles. So it really is that simple. But then the question is, why is it so complicated for Jews? And the answer is that we had an experience with God of a level of intimacy where God really showed us his essence. We got to see the essence of God. And just like anyone who gets to see more classified information, it comes with more responsibility. You know, you'll notice that... Uh, that an executive in a, let's say, an executive in a financial firm who is aware of the most sensitive information, that she will be held to a standard that is way beyond someone who might be in that same financial in institution, certainly a secretary or a, uh, or maybe a, a financial analyst or something that they'd be, depending on how high up you are with the sensitivity of the information will be the rules you'll be dealing with. You know, meaning the more connected you are to the to the, to the real stuff, the more alignment issues you're going to have. The more details, the more compliance, the more uh, signatures on, a, on a, um, uh, not, you know, whatever the word is, confidentiality, more signatures you'll be signing on confidentiality. You'll notice it also even appears in their clothing, meaning uh, what someone who maybe does deliveries for the company wears versus an executive in the firm wears. It's going to be different clothing. Even women, I feel bad for executive women in Manhattan because they have nowhere to shop. They have to go to Borough Park if they want to buy an outfit. Why? Because they wear, they wear, um, they dress exactly like Haredi women. These are Gentiles who have, you know, executive positions in firms. And there's nowhere to buy a suit that really is, has the level of modesty that someone who is on that level of executive, that level of executive, responsibility, it's very hard to shop. Just like any woman who lives in Borough Park knows, it's so hard to shop. Because the vast majority of chains aren't selling anything that you would call clothing. And so, the, um, some shops, at least in the, during their summer lines especially, they, uh, there's not enough fabric to clothe a woman's body once in the entire store. <laughs> so, Anyway, but that's the way it goes. So the Jews at Mount Sinai were given the most sensitive information. We got to see God's essence. Now, once you see God's essence, well, that comes with a heavy responsibility. And what is the level of responsibility? What are all these commandments? Are they arbitrary? The answer is no. These are the actual pipes of creation. Now, listen carefully. I'm going to teach you a little bit of Kabbalah. Nothing deep, nothing detailed, but just a little bit of Kabbalah. The Kabbalah I'm teaching you now is the is the, comes off of the following line. He looked into the Torah and he created the world. That's the quote from the Zohar. God looked into the Torah and created the world. What is that telling you about the Torah? What it's telling you about the Torah is that the Torah is actually the blueprint of the entire creation. Now, normally, you don't need to really deal with blueprints. You know, I mean, I, I think all of us have grown up in homes that we never have even saw the blueprint. We don't really care about the blueprint. You know, you can actually burn the blueprint. It wouldn't be a good idea to use it as, you know, fire starter. But uh, you could burn the blueprint. Your house will not disappear. You'll still have your house and you no longer have the blueprint. The, uh, in this particular case, the blueprint is the turret. The Torah is the actual blueprint of creation. Now, some of you might be asking, but the Torah was received at Sinai. You already discussed that at 2448. How could that be the blueprint of the creation itself? The answer to that question is that there is an upper Torah and there is a lower Torah. 
there is an upper Torah, which is the blueprint, and then the lower Torah is the one we got that Moses wrote. And by the way, when he wrote it, just to make that really clear, he wasn't writing it like you or I might write a book. He ghost wrote it, meaning God wrote it through his hand, kind of like a heart rate monitor. Have you ever seen the paper going by a heart rate monitor? And there's a little thing that's kind of like stenciling in the, the words. That's the way Moses wrote it, and that's why we say Vizos this is the Torah that God, that Moses placed before the children of Israel. Alpi Hashem, the Yad Moshe. It was God's mouth, Moses' hand. But Moses was just like this the whole time. <laughs> you can imagine Moses writing the Torah. He was like, he was like this. He was like, whoa, <laughs> really? <laughs> you know, like what? People anywhere near my age, which I see a, a few in the room, um, people anywhere near my age know that there were in uh, the original big screen TVs and there were even movies put out like this were on what are called RVG projectors red blue green projectors where you had a projector that produced it just had a green light or a red light a blue light and I remember I was actually on an LL flight a few years ago that still had them LL has uh, you know one of the reasons we all love LL is because they use only vintage air aircraft <laughs> this guy, the guy sitting in front of me, his chair wouldn't even go up and down. <laughs> it was Economy Plus. Right. So like, we're so sorry. It's a really old airplane. So the anyway, we still had the little things and the, the you know that <coughs> comes out of the with the string. <laughs> it's just so embarrassing these airplanes. They have ashtrays. <laughs> do they still have ashtrays too? Some do. <laughs> I think now they're called gum trays. <laughs> anyway, but I, I actually was on an LL flight a few years ago with an RBG projector. And the, um, and the, uh, oh, LL, uh, the, even today, like on these vintage craft, they, they have a movie that everyone's got to watch for like the first hour. Like they put it on everyone's screens. There was no way out of it, and it had, like, I don't want to, I don't want to say any graphic detail, but let's just say it had things that even the most secular person in the world wouldn't want their kid watching, who's sitting next to them on the airplane. But the, meanwhile, eighty percent of the plane look, everyone looked like me, and we don't even look at screens, like the screen on our phones, like it's about as far as we go, and they, you know, we don't watch movies, we don't watch screens, like it's just not part of our lifestyle, and yet they subjected all these people to this, and on the flight. In it was like ninety percent observant. Just people were complaining. People were like, like no one here wants to see this. Yet it's in front, ten centimeters in front of everyone's face. And, uh, and you know what they did? They they shut off the whole system. And they told all the secular people in the plane that the system broke. <laughs> there were no movies the entire trip. <laughs> Twelve hours, no no entertainment on the on the thing. And then they, they, they totally destroy their poor stewardesses and stewards because also the black hattitude men don't want to sit next to, uh, I mean, they do want to sit next to the women, but they, they're, trying to, you know, they're trying to work on themselves and not sit next to the women. So they, don't, so they refuse to sit next to the women that they, you know, probably their Yitzhahara would like to sit next to. So because they don't want to do that, so every trip leaves late. And the stewards and the stewards go crazy because now they're suddenly like they're like maitre d's of restaurants <laughs> trying to seat everybody and asking people to get out of their chairs. It's Can't they just sit in a plastic bag? That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I finally I finally figured out how to get I finally had to figure out I figured out how to get women out of their seats. By the way, I don't do that. I just No, they they do for a colonist, you know. Yeah. I just sit next to the lady on the plane. I don't do, I don't actually do it. But, uh, but I finally figured out how to get the lady out of her seat. You see, the way you get the lady out of her seat is that, you see, the old ways was the stewardess goes up to the lady and says, you see that chassid standing by the kitchen over there? She was like, yeah. And she says, he doesn't want to sit next to a woman. And the woman looks at her and she's like, in 2017, after 70 years of feminism, I have to get out of my seat. <laughs> Tell them to go to hell. Yeah, and that's what happens every flight. And then eventually it gets published on like Facebook. You know, or something. So, so I figured out exactly how to get the woman out of her seat. 
you walk up to her and you say, you see that chassid standing over there by the kitchen? She's like, yeah. He really wants to sit next to you. <laughs> <laughs> she says, I'll move. <laughs> Happy to move. Now, um, anyway, the reason why I'm on this rant is because it's because these ridiculous people booking the seats are ill all. They see the names. There's no way a guy named Avraham Goldstein's a woman. <laughs> Put him next to Yankee Goldblatt. <laughs> Just set it up that way. Offer also, offer these three rows are men only. These three rows are women only. And all the husbands will sit there and all the wives will sit there. And you've already taken care of nine major issues. Not nine, 18. Because you got the nine men and the nine women. Like, 18 issues have been taken care of right there. Like, duh. Block out the seats and offer it. And let your poor stewardesses do their jobs. Other than seating everybody and getting everyone so upset. It's like the simplest solutions in the world. But, no. And this has been going on forever. This problem. Now... I did actually find a lady uh, who brought her dog on board last last Thursday. Her, she had a little lap dog. She bought a seat for her dog. This dog was her child, I think. And and the but the funniest thing was next to the dog was a chassid. <laughs> <laughs> this chassidish bachar would sit next to a dog the whole time. The boy's like, because chassidim were scared to death of dogs. And so the whole time the boy's like, don't bite me, don't bite me. He didn't get a wink of sleep the whole flight. He just spent the whole time vigilant trying not to get bit by her lap dog. You know, the lap dog was just staring at him the whole time. Going, yeah. so maybe he'll sit next to a dog, but he won't sit next to a woman. <laughs> Now, um, back to connecting to God. The, <laughs> so I remember being on this flight, and I'm looking at the RBG projector, and I'm looking at the screen, and you know, and I'm going like this. How did this red, blue, green light become the images on the screen? But I knew intuitively, even though I have no idea what the technology is, and it's mind-boggling, but I knew intuitively, embedded in those three lights is the movie. Embedded in those three lights is Harrison Ford driving some car across a desert landscape. Okay? Embedded in those lights, for sure. No one would argue that. Somehow in those lights, it's embedded. That's the upper Torah. The upper Torah is a Torah that has all of creation embedded in it. The upper Torah is the Torah the Kabbalists learn. When we read Torah, we're reading stories. we got the creation story story of Noah, the story of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes, the story of Egypt and the leaving of Egypt, the story of the Jews in the desert. You got stories. When Now that's the lower Torah, that's our Torah, that's the screen. When you look at the upper Torah, the upper Torah is the, the upper Torah is the, is where all of this is being projected from. That's the Torah God looked into and created the world with it. And when a Kabbalist studies Torah, he's actually studying that. When I'm learning Kabbalah on a, the, of the Torah, you have no idea. You would have no idea what parsha you're studying. You have to actually look at the top of the page to remind yourself what parsha you're in, because it's it's the upper Torah. Kabbalists are studying the upper Torah. Now, if you want to hear something interesting about extraterrestrial life, if there was such a thing as extraterrestrial life, which by all statistics is I mean, absolutely mathematically impossible that there would be extra, uh, extra terrestrial. terrestrial life. I want to say extracurricular. Extra, it'd be almost impossible that there would be, a, meaning mathematically there is none. The only way there could possibly be other life on another planet would only be because God decided to recreate the conditions that are necessary here. And do you guys know how many parameters are necessary for there to be life on Earth? They're, they've gotten to 200 parameters that if one were missing, there would be no life on Earth. You have no idea what that means, to have 200 parameters. Because all the parameters are obviously in sync with each other. And so, and so it's, it's therefore statistically impossible that we should be here. <laughs> and believing it happened randomly would be the biggest act of faith that you could ever do. 
meaning meaning the common sense that God made this is is probably a million times stronger than than the faith that you'd need that that somehow randomly this occurred. Do you guys know that that's where we've come to at this point in science? Science has basically gotten us to the level of 200 parameters, all of which need each other. And so so it's now become that science has proven God and uh, and that uh, and that to believe what science originally thought they could do when, for example, Time Magazine put out the, art, the a giant on the cover, God is dead. They wrote that, God is dead. That was the whole cover of a Time Magazine, and then it was all about how science has like replaced, our understanding of the world has replaced our need for God. And, uh, and it turns out now that we're holding in a much different place 20 years later in science, They've come up with the fact that it's um, that you'd ha it would be in insane blind faith to say that this happened randomly, and it would be absolute common sense that those parameters would have had to have been set up by a, a designer who set up the 200 parameters necessary. And I'm sure they're going to find more as they understand more, but the t those 200 uh, interlinked parameters um, would only be possible if they were set up. And therefore, even though there could be uh, uh, billions of galaxies, billions, meaning, meaning life on our galaxy of the Milky Way, which has its own billions of stars, that's probably not going to happen, that there's life out there. But maybe in all those other galaxies, they're thinking mathematically, maybe. So it turns out that mathematically not. It's not, not possible. Not mathematically possible. There's no statistical possibility of life anywhere else. However, there could be. Why? Because the same God that put life here could put life there. So there could be. Now, we don't have a Torah tradition that there is necessarily. Um, so, so we don't know if there is or there isn't. Why am I talking about extraterrestrials right now? You may be wondering, why is the rabbi talking about extraterrestrials? The reason I'm discussing extraterrestrials right now is because if there were extraterrestrials and we could somehow reach them, which would also be impossible, but let's say we could reach them, and we took a spaceship to reach them. And the reason why that would be impossible is just because uh, with our lifespan, uh, you'd have to live, um, I forget what the number would be, but you'd have to live mul many millions of years to travel light years to where these places would be. Does that make any sense? You'd have to live millions of years to travel light years to get to the places where there could potentially be life. And imagine the, the waste of money they wasted on trying to find life on other planets, you know, when in fact we'll never, ever, ever be able to, to uh, communicate maybe, if they communicate potential possibility. Because they, they have, there is some new technology that we just heard about in Tubishvat about. think it will happen in our lifetimes, but, the, but they were able to get something up to a third of the speed of light. Wouldn't be human beings, obviously, but uh, cameras. And once you have cameras, you can have microphones, so it could be like our great-great-great-grandchildren could hear about, could hear about, you know, <laughs> some report about life on some other planet, you know, our great-great-great-grandchildren. Gee, that sounds like something worth investing in, huh? Um, I'd rather invest in feeding the planet, personally, in removing nuclear weapons from the planet as well. Now, um, don't worry, I'm going to button up all these subjects eventually. Um, but imagine we all travel to that planet, and we get to that planet, and we're there, a bunch of scientists meeting the, their scientists. But what do we do? We bring along one Jew who's learned in all of the Torah. And he asks them, have you ever received a book? Did you, did you ever receive a document from God? And so the answer might be, well, why would we have that? I mean, we intuited God naturally. Like, we're, we're searchers. I mean, we got brains, and we thought of searching, and the very first humans thought of searching. And we intuited God's existence, and we've been living that way ever since. That would have been smart people. Or they could have had a planet where there are dumb people. Can you imagine a planet full of dumb people? 
who don't <laughs> intuit in search. <laughs> okay, so maybe they're, they're like our planet, that is the planet of dumb people. And they didn't intuit, and they didn't search, and they didn't align themselves with what they found out when they search. And so they say, yeah, we did get a book. I guess that whatever that being is we call God got frustrated and realized we're just not into the search. And so he sent us a book. Okay, great. Can we see the book? So then they break out the book. Now they pull the Jew out. Hey, Jew, come look at this book. And the Jew looks at the book, and he's so excited to see Hebrew. He's like, wow, it's Hebrew. Because it would most likely be these letters that we know. Ashuris letters that we all grew up looking at the Shin and the Bet and the Aleph and the Dalit and the Hey. And, and so he would probably be excited to see that it's Hebrew, but he might be disappointed to see it's a different story. It's not our story. Now, why would it not be our story? Why would it not be our story? Why wouldn't it say something about Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? Who can answer that question? Because it was for them. It's their planet, their history. And their whole, the whole unfolding of the, of the evolution of their ex relationship with God, culminating in some kind of revelation where they got the book. So it would be totally different characters and a totally different story. But the Kabbalist might be, a, you know, this Jew might have been a little disappointed, but he says to them, tell me, do you have a Kabbalist on your planet? And they're like, oh yeah, sure. We got this place called, uh, we got a neighborhood, it's called, um, uh, it's called Ta, Tafit. Tafit It's backwards for Zfat, which is how they play pronounced Sfat on signs. When you get near Sfat, it says Zfat. <laughs> have you guys ever noticed the signs in Israel are crazy? <laughs> yeah, they all have Rabbi HaMashiach. <laughs> <laughs> Your first comment was a little wild, but that one was right on. No, of course I was kidding, but I seen a picture of a cone sitting in a plastic bag because he flies over a cemetery. <laughs> On an airplane. <laughs> With a breathing apparatus? I don't know. I was gonna look it up, but again, but probably not. Is that is that crazy? Was this real or was it a joke? No, it's real. Oh, it's real. <laughs> The coin was in a plastic bag on the airplane in case it flew over a cemetery. <laughs> this is getting better. I thought we were just saying something really random. Well, of course not. Okay, now uh, he says, so is there a Kabbalist in this place? So he meets the Kabbalist. And the same story about Moses or Abraham or whatever, when, the, when, this, when we read it in Kabbalah and when they read their story about some other character, it's the same exact story. It's the same exact story. It's just, when you go to the upper Torah, it's the same Torah. It's the same God. It's the same everything. It's just that our lower Torah is not necessarily the same book. Now, I'd like to just conclude this little part of the class regarding the Torah. Is, um, is that when the upper Torah, how the upper Torah sends it to sends our creation into existence. What I'd like to do is, um, can I borrow this cell phone? Uh, you're recording, right? Okay, that's fine. He's just recording, so it's just a recording, but I'm gonna pretend I'm shooting a picture of the upper Torah, okay? So I'm going all the way up to the source, the highest source of the upper Torah, and I press the button, click, so that now is a picture of the Torah. Okay, now I go lower, click, meaning this is the Torah. It's coming down, by the way, I didn't mention that, but the letters are actually flowing down the screen they're flowing down this world. They're weaving our creation. Our creation is only being woven by those letters at the very bottom. So, you know what it'd be like? It'd be like a slot machine. Have you ever seen a slot machine in Vegas where, the, where the, the three wheels are spinning after you pull it? And then this one locks in, and that one locks in, and that one locks in? So, for example, if it's a dog, 
Let's say you're looking at a dog. An Adam who wanted to name the dogs, it says that Adam saw from one end of the world to the other. It doesn't mean horizontally. It meant he saw from the spiritual world where the Torah releases the letters into creation. Where the Torah is releasing those letters. What letters? Is let there be animals upon the earth from Genesis. Those are the letters. And it releases those letters. And then those letters are moving their way down and calculating down the system. And they're, they're going through 231 exponentials. It's extreme mathematics. But it's 231 exponentials. It's, it's actually an algorithm. Aleph, bet, aleph, gimel, aleph, dalet, aleph, hey, bet, aleph, bet, gimel, bet, bet. Every letter goes through. If you do the math, it's 231. If you go through the whole aleph, bet, the 22 letters comes to 231 intercalculations. But don't forget, every letter is a number, and it's like every shape is meaningful of each letter. And they're, they're coming down a system and slowly weaving. Now, when it finally gets down to the level of, of Adam now staring at a dog, he watched the letters shooting down. And then when he finally looks at the dog, the, the slot machine stops. You know, like, it just goes, cough. Love it. Bet. And he looks at the dog, he's like, kill it. And God's like, on the nose. You got it. And that's why it says in Genesis, a superfluous little statement, he says, whatever he named the animals was its name. What's that supposed to mean? Whatever he names it. It should say, and he named the animals. Why does it say whatever he named the animals was its name? And that's what it's saying. It, meaning he got it on the nose. He hit it each time. Every animal, every creation he saw, he looked at it, and he saw it coming down the system, and he saw it locking in to the slot machine, and then named it as, 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 as it actually was, says the Torah. He actually got it right. So the word Caleb is not just the word Caleb, it's also a dog. For example, if you look at the word Mayim, for example, it is my favorite example, it's just fun to do. And that's, uh, if you look at the word Mayim, so it's got a Mem, a Yud, and a Mem. So... The mem is actually, mem is hydrogen, and a yud is oxygen in the periodic table. So if you know the, the uh, water molecules made of a two H's and an O, okay? So like, mayim, mayim is not like any other word like water, or agua, or aqua. The word agua is symbolic to make your brain think of that stuff called water. The word water in, in German Wasser, is a, it's a symbol to make your brain make the move to water. But when you're speaking Hebrew, you're actually speaking the master language that the stuff's made of. So when you're looking at a dog, dog is a symbol for the word dog. But Kelev is the dog. The dog's made of Kelev. The water... When you say the word Mayim, you're actually talking about the actual molecule, the molecular buildup. It is H2O. When you look at the sun, for example, Shin is carbon. Uh, shin. So when you look at the sun, for example, it's a, it's a burning ball of hydrogen. Even the shape of the Shin is the shape of fire. It's a burning ball of hydrogen, Shemesh. The, if you look at the word year, for example, Shana is, is, a, is it time? Yeah. That's passing time. Is it really? Well, I got a late start to, if you look at the word Shana, it's 355, which is exactly the lunar calendar, is 355. So like the Hebrew is, is the actual key language. Now, um, I'm going to conclude with this because we're in the middle of this. I will finish it, and then uh, everything else about connecting to God will have to do tomorrow. I apologize. Um, but I'm followed by Rabbi Aaron Neckemeyer, who should really be using FaceTime Live, Facebook Live as well, so that he can share it beyond the room. Because um, your class will have 30 people in it. Mine will have 900. Okay? I have so, to make everybody work to come to that class. they got to be a Just do it live. FaceTime live. Oh, also, please plug Discovery. You're doing Discovery on Sunday. Everybody okay. Know about it very um, please, uh, Discovery Seminar, finding out, you know, we don't call the Torah the Torah on Sunday. 
You come to H to discovery. We're gonna. We're not gonna call it the Torah. We're gonna call it a document because it is a document, and we're not gonna call it God because it is an author. So we're gonna call it document and author, and we're gonna figure out who authored the Torah. Um, shh. It'll be your, maybe for many of you the first chance you ever had in your life to stop calling that book the Torah and stop calling the author God, but to just call it a document and call it an author and see if you can figure out, because think about it, if you have a document, you should be able to dis determine whether a man wrote it versus God. Like, it should, you know, it should reek of one or the other. So, but, it, but what we discovered is it reeks much more than, than uh, one or the other. And uh, come check that out yourselves. That's Discovery on Sunday. And today I'm followed by Rabbi Neckemeyer, who, uh, if you put it in a nutshell, how would you put it in a nutshell what your class is about? In a nutshell. No, no, I want to know for real. Discover. Discover. Ask, ask Javi. Javi, what, how would you put his class in a nutshell? I'm going to say this every day from now on so you better okay. No, but Q&A is not compelling at all for someone to say. Wait, guys, we're not finished. Please settle down. What? Getting to what your real question is. But most people don't even realize they have a question. really, really, really want to know. Oh, it's a class on what you really, really, really want to know. But apparently, if you do this class, if you do Rabbi Nekomar's class, you, you will be hooked. Um, unless you're not hooked, and then you won't come back. But you should always do it once. Always do it once. So if anyone's never heard it, definitely do it once. Um, now, here we go. La ladies and gentlemen, just say the Torah, okay? If I shoot a picture of the, oral, oh, of, the, of the upper Torah, yeah? And what do I have a photo of? The Torah. The Torah. Thank you. Please join. Okay, I shoot a lower picture where it's weaving more. Shoot a picture. What is it a picture of? Torah. 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 Lower. Torah. Lower. Torah. Lower. Torah. Everyone, you're not saying Torah. You're all just sitting there going, <laughs> together. Torah. Shoot. Torah. Click. Torah. Click. Torah. Click. Torah. Click. Torah. Click. Torah. Click. Torah. Smile. Torah. Now I shoot a picture because this is where it finally wove. It wove into physicality. Everyone smile. I'm not shooting a picture. It's on. <laughs> it, we're recording. But I'm shooting the picture. Everyone smile. Click. Torah. And now I show you a picture of the classroom. Everyone's sitting in the classroom. What is that a picture of? Torah. Together. Torah. 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 See, you've been sitting here all this time in your life wondering whether you want to live a Torah life or not. Guess what? You're always living a Torah life. You've been inside the Torah since the day you were born. You've never been outside the Torah. I know that looks like that's outdoors, out the window, and this is indoors. This is all in the Torah. You've only been in the Torah. You've never been outside the Torah. The question of whether you want to live a Torah life or not is not a question like that, because you're always living a Torah life. The question is, do you want to live a Torah life aligned with Torah and connected to the to Creator? Or would you like to live in the Torah but totally spaced out to it? And where do you, that's your choice. You're always in the Torah. Do you want to live in the Torah aligned with it? Or do you want to live in the Torah spaced out to it? But you've always been in it. The choice is yours. Shalom, everyone.